Hello and welcome to the uh, first video for Humanities 203, Ancient and Medieval. And what we're going to talk about today is the ancient Greek world. Uh, in fact, we're going to go through um, a bit of a preliminary discussion before we get into this um, account. So what we'll be looking at first is really what uh, the question of what humanities is as a discipline um, and I think it's important that we discuss this so that we can then get into the larger issues underlying our course and how we'll be studying and looking at them. So let's get started. Uh, we have the question first of all what is humanities? And I think this question is raised especially within the context of the sciences today, especially natural science, mathematics, etc., um, particularly due to the fact that we see that a lot of these sciences have developed substantially beyond what was seen um, in their archaic or classical origins. Um, on the other hand, when we look at something like the humanistic disciplines, something like art, history, philosophy, etc., it seems that, well, knowledge there doesn't seem to have that kind of progressive development. Um, now, there's a particular reason for this. It does not mean, however, that there is no knowledge within the humanistic disciplines. It just means that the kind of knowledge that we obtain is not progressive in the sense in which we find it within the natural sciences. I think a very good example of that can be seen in terms of the study of history. Although history as it uh, studies the past, and although the past certainly um, has a general structure because it's the structure of time, the years go by and you study the history of it, there's certainly no, let's say, built-in structure in terms of the knowledge of history. Historians need to study specific era. They can study how uh, events uh, build on, uh, cause other events and lead to other events. But the structure of knowledge is different from, say, something like mathematics, where you can start with certain axioms or starting points, and then you can use reason to lead to all these various conclusions and proofs, something like you'd see in geometry and arithmetic, for example. So uh, the humanities themselves are, as I state here, a group of academic disciplines. All right? um, we have here art, history, philosophy. We can also talk about philology or the study of, of languages. We have the classics, for example, the Greek and Latin classics or German or French classics. Uh, we have linguistics also would be an academic discipline. Also law would be something along the lines of, of the humanistic discipline. Uh, it moves into the social sciences as well. Now, the way I'm going to, to discuss these disciplines is that they study something like the human experience. Of course, this is very difficult to identify because for sure the sciences study the human experience. Well, we are experiencing a world and physics not only studies that world that's outside of us but it also studies that world from the perspective of the fact that we as human beings are the ones experiencing it so if you abstract the human being from that experience then well I guess you wouldn't have the world anyhow well this leads us into philosophical issues that we won't get into at the moment but the point is is that even science deals with the human experience uh, the difference is that the the humanistic sciences seem to deal with that experience from the perspective of more of its creative productive uh, aspects also those aspects in which we are actors and doers within our experience and also aspects in which we reflect upon the nature of our own experience ask questions philosophical questions such as you know what is the purpose of, and meaning of life okay historical questions such as you know what happened in when Caesar crossed the Rubicon and etc so now what we're going to do within this introductory lesson is just talk a little bit about the knowledge that we obtain within the humanistic disciplines and some of the methods employed therein and we're going to distinguish this from what we see within the scientific disciplines so one way of doing this there are many ways 
uh, and none of them is in fact perfect, but one way is through the exploration and the distinction within the different sciences that we see between the nature and use of a hypothesis. So a hypothesis, as I say here, is a statement um, which basically asserts something about the nature of things, right? The way things are. And I, I give some examples of some hypotheses here. We say the Earth is round. Well, we have to confirm this. We can see this, for example, from the fact that ships sink within the horizon as they proceed outward. Um, if we go into, for example, into space, we can see that the Earth is round. We see this, for example, from the pers perspective of other planets. We study gravity, we see this. So we can confirm this in various ways. Notice that the second hypothesis, there is a greatest possible number. We know this, it seems, in a different way uh, than we know the fact that, can know that the, fact the Earth is round. So it's not something that can be seen or perceived or observed in the way in which we observe the roundness of the Earth. So we have a different type of hypothesis. Obviously, it's a mathematical hypothesis. Um, the third one, God exists. Now, obviously, the way knowing this um, is going to involve certain kinds of justifications and explanations, also denying this, uh, that will differ from something like the mathematical and physical hypotheses. Okay, So what we're seeing here is three types of hypotheses and one is representative of the physical or natural sciences, the other of mathematics, and the third seems to be more involved in the humanistic sciences, something spiritual that we look to. All right. So how do we actually verify these hypotheses? Now by verify I mean show that these hypotheses, hypotheses are true or valid as we say it in philosophy, valid. Um, well, in natural science, obviously, in order to show that a hypothesis is valid, you have to demonstrate it in some way, So, and you have to confirm it in some way. And that's why I state here that it involves empirical confirmation. So, for example, if I tell you that, as we see the hypothesis down here in the middle, within a vacuum, two objects of differing mass, m and n, will fall at the same time. Okay, same speed, sorry. Um, in order to actually show that this is the case, you actually have to do the experiment. You have to verify it. So you take something like a feather and a weight of 30 pounds, okay? And you find a vacuum, so there's no air pressure, there's nothing interfering. You drop the feather and the 30 pound weight, and in fact, you'll see that they both fall at the same time, which is a certain property of gravity. Now, notice how the proof here Okay, it's not really a proof in the mathematical sense, you see that? So the word proof here is being used in ways which have an appeal to something like the mathematical sense, but also refers to something uh, different. So when we say proof, we mean in this case, well, something that is verified through our senses. So we actually have to do the experiment. We drop the objects, okay, for example, from a rooftop, and we see if they fall at the same speed. If they do, then we confirm our hypothesis, okay? Now, you should notice about the hypotheses of natural science that they're never really hard and fast uh, confirmed for all times uh, for the fact that every time that we, need, we talk about this hypothesis, well, we actually need to confirm it or verify it in order to see if it still holds. This is not the case in mathematics, okay? We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but the difference is that, well, you can ask, well, wait a minute, maybe the two objects, if I go, for example, somewhere like to the moon and I do the same experiment, experiment maybe they won't work there. And the reason that you can think this way and, and continue to question the hypotheses of natural science is that those, those hypotheses are, require the empirical verification, whereas when, when we get to something like mathematics, okay, we have logical certainty and deductive reasoning the use of proof in a strict mathematical sense and once something is proved it's proved for all time and there's no questioning that hypothesis now there might be ways of reconceiving a hypothesis in terms of its foundations but that's different from questioning the hypothesis okay once it's actually proved it's done so with mathematics we have deductive reasoning and we move from premises which are our initial statements to a conclusion and 
if it's a proof, then it's going to be a logically certain conclusion. So take this hypothesis that there is a greatest possible number. And here, I get, this is actually easy, fairly easy to prove. This is kind of a summary proof. And let's use this example. Let n be the greatest possible number. And then we have since n is a number, it functions as any number. So we can add to it, we can subtract to it, etc. Let's add to it. When we add to it, we obtain a new number, m equals n plus, plus 1. But then m is greater than n, right? But the problem is this. n was supposed to be the greatest possible number. But there seems to be a number that's greater than n, which is n plus 1. Okay, so basically by the principle of mathematical induction, which we won't worry about here, um, it follows that n cannot be the greatest possible number, that there can be no greatest possible number. Okay, So the hypothesis is false in this time, or invalid. All right, so notice that the proof given is, is once and for all stated, it's finished, and we don't have to worry about whether there's a greatest possible number anywhere anymore, because there isn't, because every number that we produce as an example of the greatest possible number, you can always add to it, so you always have a greater number. All right, now that's not the case, of course, with natural science. For sure, you can say that I dropped the objects, I showed you, but then you could say, well, I kind of forgot. Why don't you show me the experiment again? Ah, okay, it works. And this is an important difference because one of the distinctions between something like mathematics and the humanistic disciplines and the natural sciences is that the natural sciences in, deal in trying to confirm their hypotheses are in fact trying to falsify them. In other words, a hypothesis will be stable, such as this hypothesis, and will be maintained until somebody shows that, well, no, here's an example where the hypothesis doesn't work. So imagine some alien planet, and there's this strange area within this alien planet, and if you drop two objects, suddenly one of the objects having heavier mass, or just being heavier, suddenly falls faster. Well, obviously, this hypothesis no longer holds, and so we need to reconceive the hypothesis. So the difference here is that the hypotheses of natural science, well, basically, we call them contingent. So in other words, we see that it's the case, but it could possibly be otherwise. And this we think, well, it could possibly be otherwise that the objects fall at different speeds, okay? But with the mathematical hypotheses, well, we, once we get the proof, we realize, well, it cannot but be the way it is, okay? Um, now let's move to the hypotheses of humanities. So here I use the term explanatory justification. So in the humanities, in the humanistic disciplines, there are certain types of hypotheses that can neither be proved mathematically, nor can they be, be empirically verified. And I think a good example of this is the hypothesis that God exists. Well, um, unless we say that God is nature, um, then there's certainly no way of proving that God exists by way of showing that, well, this is God. And certainly, if we look at the classical Western tradition, the nature of God is conceived of or understood as an immaterial, non-physical, spiritual being. So, from the fact that God has no physical properties, there's no way of giving of verifying or, or empirically confirming God's existence through science. We also cannot use science to show that God does not exist in this way. All right, so how does the humanistic uh, sciences deal with this? Well, the way to look at it is think of a trial, okay? Because when we look at some of the evidence surrounding, okay, the hypothesis of God's existence, we can say, well, all right, and I'm just going to give you a few examples of this, and then we can talk about the trial analogy. Look at the world around us. Well, we can see that it seems that there has been a big bang. It seems that the big bang initiated from nothing. And if we consider the nature of things, then it seems evident that, well, from nothing we can't get something. So that means that, well, prior to the big bang, if there was nothing, then it's impossible that the Big Bang should have happened. So there must have been something there prior, before the universe and before the universe itself, which is the source of the Big Bang. And that something, let us call it God. All right? Now, of course, and God, you could say God then is the origin of the universe, 
and because the universe requires a cause for its existence, which that cause we call God, therefore God must exist, right? Um, that's one type of, of proof of God's existence. It's called a cosmological proof. There are many different types of proofs. There's also proofs against the existence of God. Notice this, though, that the proof is not mathematical in the sense that the premises and the conclusions follow with absolute logical certainty. You have to accept some of these premises. You have to accept the idea that the universe ha must have a cause or the universe is not self-caused. And in attempting to offer, um, to persuade the, the one who is listening uh, to the cogency of the proof, basically you need to offer some kind of a narrative surrounding the actual ideas and the hypotheses and the premises that you're using. And this is done, for example, in a trial. So if someone commits a crime or supposedly commits a crime, we get a prosecution and a defense. Both the prosecution and the defense must look at the evidence. And so they look at the facts and then they make a narrative surrounding the facts. And notice this, that of course, the, both the prosecution and the defense will offer an opposite interpretation of the facts. And they use that narrative to produce an opposite interpretation. Now, of course, hopefully one interpretation is usually the correct interpretation and our jurors should be the ones that are able to correctly assess, to evaluate, and to analyze these interpretations, the narratives from the prosecution and the defense to, to see which narrative offers the more compelling explanatory, just, justificatory explanation of the events surrounding the crime. And so the juror must make a, a decision. So this is kind of what we do when we talk about the nature of God's existence. Oftentimes, one will have belief for or against God's existence, and one will create that narrative surrounding one's ideas by looking to physics, by looking to different logical explanations, by looking to our moral actions, looking to what would happen if we didn't have moral actions, you see? And so we create a very large narrative, a kind of worldview, as you see, I, I, this is called the ancient worldview, surrounding, and it's this entire worldview that comes into play when we say that God exists or God does not exist. And really, taking one side or the other will really alter the fundamental aspects, not just of that little part, that little hypothesis, but of one's entire worldview that we're talking about when we get into this. So, we have then different methods of the humanities. Um, let's just review these very quickly. You should understand that these methods are not only employed within the humanistic disciplines, but they are indeed employed in other disciplines, okay, such as mathematics uses analysis, um, physics uses interpretation, etc. So analysis we see here is something of like the breaking of the complex into the simple. So it's basically taking a complex whole and analyzing it so that one identifies the parts and then looking at those parts separate from the whole. And here I say if we talk about the nature of thought, okay, if you're thinking, well you can do different things. You can understand something, for example I ask, well do you understand what I'm talking about? You say yes, okay? And that's different from something like a judgment, forming a judgment, set of, for example, a value judgment, saying, oh, I really don't like that shirt. That's different from understanding. And then there's reasoning, okay? The kind of reasoning I talked about in discussing the cosmological arguments. So I said, well, look, we hit the world is here. Something must be the cause of the world. Um, such a cause is God. You see, we have this reasoning. Now, notice how we broke up thought as a single term, a common term, into these various notions, okay? And if we look at the structure of things, we can usually find some kind of complex structure which can be analyzed into simple structures and we do this in humanities so that we can understand more complex things and after understanding those complex things in terms of the simple we can use the simple to explain that which is complex. Now interpretation, and notice the color of this one is a little different because interpretation is extremely important for the humanistic disciplines uh, but also very important for the works that we'll be studying within this class and the kinds of um, assignments that we'll be doing. So interpretation I use here is the disclosure of meaning. In other words, it's taking a meaning which is not quite evident and 
trying to elucidate, clarify that meaning, to broaden it, to make it, to allow, to bring that meaning into, a, or, or rather to bring one's intellect, one's thought process, into a deeper understanding or broader understanding of the meanings. And the example I give here, for example, from the New Testament, the, the opening section of the book of John, we had the Gospel of John, we have, in the beginning was the Word. And notice we have word here, and we can ask, well, what does word mean? And once we ask that question, what does word mean? Well, we have to give an interpretation. And whatever answer you give, you should understand, is already based upon an interpretation. Because in some ways, well, we come to the, the books and to, the, to reality and to our experience with the cup full in the sense that, well, we have an interpretation of things before we even experience them. Um, Anyhow, let's move on. We have argumentation, okay, the use of argument to convince, and I gave that the example of, cosmo of uh, the cosmological argument, and here's another example that ghosts probably don't exist because, you see, and you give a reason, no evidence has been given for them, okay? Explanation, we see, is an account, as, as, I, as I define it here, that gives the why or cause of a thing. That's a little different from argumentation. It's related, but explanation doesn't necessarily to have, uh, doesn't necessarily need to be tied to an argument. We have, for example, that World War I resulted from the assassination of the Prussian Archduke. So we have World War I. We say, what's the cause of it? What's the explanation of the cause? We say, well, one of the explanations was the assassination of the Prussian Archduke. Narration. We saw that with the example of um, discussing the, the method in which uh, the humanistic disciplines ought to attempt to demonstrate their hypotheses by way of explanatory just, justification. Well, we create interpretations and narrations surround, surrounding the events. Uh, we're going to see a lot of narration in terms of the stories we'll be reading in this class, but generally in terms of expla explanation and knowledge, we have that narration is a story weaving events or facts, etc., into a whole. And here you could think of a book that you read about the American Revolution or the Civil War or World War I, etc. These are various narratives discussing the events. Okay? We have then description, which is a little different, where you give a account of the features and characteristics of something. For example, I say Oh, my car is blue, it has a dent in the front, my house is also has a blue front door, etc. That's description, where you're taking specific features, you're identifying them, and you're relating it to the thing of which you're talking, okay? And you can get very specific with description as well. And then there's criticism, finally. And by criticism, I don't mean negatively um, attacking something that can be involved in criticism, but criticism is used in the sense of art criticism or literary criticism where you're evaluating something and attempting to determine its value, and by value here it means um, what that object's relevance is in terms of the larger uh, picture or discussion within which it's being evaluated. So for example, if you encounter a work of art from a new artist, you can say, well, okay, what is the standing of this work of art relative to the, to, to the contemporary art scene itself? Is, can we consider this a novel work of art? Has it broken new, new boundaries in some way? Or does it fit into some mold uh, that's already been done so we can classify it, for example, as a type of abstract art? You see, this is evaluation, right? And, well, this is the type of, of criticism that I mean. Ancient Greek civilization. We'll be talking a lot about uh, the ancient Greeks in particular, um, for the most part, since we'll be looking at and studying the uh, studying and reading the works of Homer, in particular, his Odyssey, which is a story of the travails of one of the ancient Greek heroes of legend. Um, who hails from the Mycenaean age. In order to really uh, understand and get some kind of context for understanding Homer, it's good to have some sort of background um, in this. Now, of course, uh, it'd probably be best to take an entire course on the ancient Greek world, but we can't do that prior to studying Homer. So I'll just give you some tidbits here 
and along the way as we study Homer and analyze and interpret his text, we'll also I'll also give you some uh, historical uh, offer some historical overview and and uh, philosophical overview of some of the concepts as we encounter them. Now this is a picture of in fact modern Greece, so Greece today. And what I want to point out to you is its location. We see that Greece is between Turkey, the Balkan states here, it's north of Africa, and it's east of Italy, okay, which runs then up to uh, Europe. So it's situated within the Mediterranean. We have the Aegean Sea. Here's the Mediterranean Sea, the Ionian Sea. We have the Sea of Crete. Okay, these names are these words are actually uh, not in Greek, uh, not in English, but that's okay. And uh, now Crete, this island here, uh, plays some significance within the ancient world. Indeed, all the island state, all the island city states, which we which uh, they were eventually become. Uh, we see some of the Cyclades, they're called. Uh, now the the Greeks were basically seafaring peoples. Um, at the very beginning, and it would be only later that they begun, begin to sort of um, emigrate and settle in some of the, uh, these parts of Greece and create larger, vaster cities. One be, such example being Athens, which is still the main m metropolitan city of Greece today. Um, the Piraeus is the main port, which has been used since ancient times. And uh, the Cyclades and Crete, the island there, were more important in sort of the, in the more ancient times. And uh, in fact, when we start to talk about uh, Homer and the individuals of Homer, it's usually these island states and some of these outlying city-states that become important in the eventual discussion of the War of Troy and of the voyages of Odysseus. So this is a, a rendition of, of classical or ancient Greece. And uh, here we see some of the names changed. Okay, we don't have Turkey here. Macedonia okay, was a larger separate state which would eventually conquer Greece. Um, we have Thessaly. We have the Peloponnesus, Achaea. We have Athens. It's here. It's one of the earliest states. And, of course, the, the island states. Now... Just a brief timeline of some of the main events that are of significance. We see around now these all these events are within uh, BCE, so they're they're uh, at least before. Usually we say before Christ and and after Anno Domini and before. Uh, but here we we can go as far back as three thousand BC, and we have the arrival of the first. Now, Greek-speaking peoples to Greece, so there were individuals living there prior to the Greek-speaking uh, peoples' uh, sort of intrusion at that time, uh, but it's around 3000 BC that we can identify it. During the Bronze Age, uh, in which they made use of, discovered and made use of bronze, and we have first the Minoan civilization, uh, and then the Mycenaean civilization, which is of significance uh, for Homer, because Homer is basically talking, although he lives around 700 to 800 BC, his uh, works discuss the height of the Mycenaean civilization and the Trojan War. Okay, following this, we have what's called the Dark Age. Um, it's called the Dark Ages because little history, written history, is, is, is given to us, so we, we know very little about it. And we have some we have lots of wars and invasions and migrations, and this is followed by the archaic people, or archaic period. Um, here, some some important uh, points are the first Olympic Games held in 1776. We have Homer wrote, composed, placed onto onto uh, wrote down for the first time the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, we have the use of commerce and the beginnings of Western. Uh, science, mathematics, philosophy, uh, also the beginnings of democracy. So lots of things are happening during this period, things which would start to define the Western world as we know it today, even today. So then we have the classical period, and really the classical period was, is the great period of Greece 
that we all kind of think about uh, in so far as we might imagine the Greeks in their in the in the heyday of their of their greatness. Okay, uh, their art was refined. The philosophy and science of the times was refined. We have the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. Um, the Greek Greco Persian Wars. We have the Parthenon here. We'll see a picture of that later, which is where we have the Acropolis uh, uh, is featured, a famous temple, and uh, the age of drama and theater. So the tragedians of the time uh, start to develop their art. We have history and geography is is begins to be get written down. So that later on Herodotus and the histories. We'll talk about the history of the Greeks, and then we have. The Macedonians come piling in, and under the helm of Alexander the Great, they conquer Greece, and this inevitably leads to a new age called the Hellenistic Age, uh, in which the Greeks become a bit more, I'd say, skeptical about their own ability uh, to conquer the world and to be great creators. But still, during that age, they are we find great philosophers and thinkers until the Macedonians themselves are finally overcome and overpowered by the Romans, whose empire would last for centuries thereafter. Okay, some important figures of this time. We have Solon. Now, Solon was, he's, he's particularly important because he provided the Athenians at the time with what amounted to a constitution, okay, a government, and he was hailed throughout uh, uh, ancient history as one of the great wise men of the time. Um, we have some other important figures here. We have Pericles. He's famous. He's been, uh, uh, lots of his speeches have been recorded, and he was a great rhetorician, a great orator, someone who gave great speeches, um, and he was important for various um, political events that occurred and uh, wars that occurred during the time. We have Philip II, who was the father of Alexander the Great, and he sort of started the process of conquering Greece, but it would be his son, the great Alexander, who would finally conquer Greece, and he would eventually make his way as far in, as India um, until finally turning back and unfortunately dying at a very young age. Um, so Alexander is very important uh, in, this, in this history due to the fact that he leads to some deep changes in Greek culture and his wars within the East, he will eventually bring back a lot of influences from Eastern culture, which would later affect the Greeks and the development of Greek culture. Okay. Uh, we have here some philosophical and literary figures, Socrates. So Socrates is usually called the father of philosophy. Um, he's a very interesting figure during the, the high classical, the classical period, uh, we see Socrates. And he would, at some point, uh, basically, the story goes this way, that a friend of his went to the great oracle at Delphi. So there was an oracle there who would apparently, who could apparently tell the future and foretell things that would happen. Many kings reportedly went to the oracle to consult her. Uh, a friend of Socrates went to the oracle and asked her, who is the wisest, wisest in Athens? And she responded unambiguously, because usually her responses are quite ambiguous and need to be interpreted. She says, well, Socrates is the wisest. And so his friend returns and tells Socrates and says, hey, Socrates, the oracle says you're the wisest. Now, Socrates, being a very humble man, thought to himself, how could this be possible? How could I be the wisest person in Athens. There must be other people who are wiser than I am. So what he decided to do was go around Athens and ask as many people as possible what the nature of wisdom was, what their knowledge was, what they knew, what they didn't know. And he would talk to the politicians and he would talk to the artists and he would talk to the carpenters. And eventually people started to get very annoyed with Socrates because he was an extremely uh, brilliant uh, in debate in the first place. Uh, in the second place, he was constantly showing people, well, actually that they didn't know what they thought they knew. And so they took this as an insult, and eventually uh, he was executed by these larger groups, especially political groups. Uh, now, one of the historical reasons behind this, too, was that it was a new democracy in Athens at the time, and they were fearful that he was, Socrates was breaking down 
these the democracy because well the leaders were being shown to really not know much in the end but he was executed and his student at the time he really didn't have students he would just have young men who would follow him around and listen to his debates and laugh when someone was shown wrong what one of them was plato and plato was deeply influenced by this apparently he was going to uh, make a career in government or law in politics, and he decided instead to pursue the path of philosophy, which Socrates has first, had first initiated, the path of the love of wisdom. And so he founded what was called the Academy, which was really the first kind of university um, in Athens at the time. Uh, one of the great students there was Euclid, who wrote the Elements, and another great student was Aristotle, who was the teacher of Alexander the Great. It's very interesting because Aristotle was a Macedonian, in fact, when the Macedonians invaded Greece, Aristotle had to flee because he was not a Greek. He was a Macedonian, and his country was invading, so he fled. Uh, he also opened up another university called the Lyceum, which actually uh, developed the sciences. For example, biology, he, he invented, he discovered logic. He was the first individual to really establish biology as a science he was the first to really establish the notion of scientific method and, and, how, and what the nature of a science was. For example, a deductive science like mathematics. So a very great thinker. We have in literature some of the more important individuals. Hesiod, uh, about 700 BC he lives. He composes the Theogony, which gives a history of the origin of the world, okay, which doesn't really have an origin in the sense of the Christian sense, uh, being created out of nothing. It's an origin of an eternal world which continues, which has uh, which has existed forever, uh, but there are structures to it, there are beginnings to it, there are starting points to it. So first among all creation, we see something like Gaia or Earth. And then from this, we have the larger titans, these giants that kind of uh, are bloom out of these earlier pre sort of prehistoric gods and then we get from the the titans the olympians the 12 olympians who would overthrow their their mothers and fathers and send them into tartarus the abyss tartarus is going to be important because we'll be talking about dante's inferno and this descent into into hades or hell uh which will be featured also in in homer's odyssey this descent or katab katabasis as we'll, as i'll talk about um, and so all of this is kind of rooted in this kind of mythology that, that originates within Hesiod and uh, the ancient Greek culture, of course, and which will be later on tied to Christian religion and Christian uh, uh, ideas that develop from the Old and New Testament and from Christian culture. And so then we have Homer, who composes the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, compose here is an important kind of, we should put that into quotation marks. Uh, and I'll talk about this later. And then we have the tragedians, the, 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 those who developed the, the works of theater and of tragedy and comedy. And we have Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides who are important in this sense. So a few important events, um, wars in fact. We see the Trojan War, which is the war which is discussed in Homer's Iliad. Here we have Homer's Iliad. And Odyssey, we will be reading the Odyssey. The Iliad uh, predates the Odyssey and discusses uh, the Trojan War. And then the Odyssey, we see Odysseus, who is one of the great heroes of the Trojan War, will leave Troy after Troy is destroyed. And uh, he will take to sea and become lost at sea for 10 years, which leads us to his Odyssey, his travails. His, uh, now, the Iliad recounts the war itself and all the events surrounding that war which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, we see the victors with the Mycenaeans, and we have the Persian War, with, where the Greek city-states are, are, are attacked by Xerxes, the Persian leader. Here we see, we have the great uh, resistance uh, among the, the Sparta, of, in the Pelop oh, sorry, that's in the Peloponnesian War. Athens and Sparta spread to all of Greece, and we see the resentment of Athenian domination and we have Spartan and allies. So what we'll be interested more here is the Trojan War, the Persian and the Peloponnesian Wars will not really be featured in any of our discussions. So we can also look at this age from the various artistic styles that were developed um, during that time. Uh, and we see there's a number of styles uh, which bloom, that which blossom from 
uh, the, the age of Homer, the geometric age, all the way into the Hellenistic age. And what's really interesting is about this development is we see within the span of, of a couple hundred of some hundred couple hundred years just the way in which the Greeks were able to really refine and uh, perfect their art so that they truly became some of the master artists of history, really, of truly of history. Uh, I'm going to just give you a few examples because we really can't spend too much time on that here. So here's an example from the geometric period. Uh, it's called a, a crater. It's basically a kind of pot which you put something in. Um, and notice that it's called the geometric because here we have these geometric lines. Um, we have these, these kind of linear figures of animals and individuals and events being depicted. And one, one thing you'll notice is that there's the kind of black clay underneath and that this kind of the golden lines have been overlaid on top of it. And as, as we say here, that the three-dimensionality was kind of avoided. Uh, and this was kind of done deliberately, you should understand. It's not that the artist was unable to do that. It just became kind of the style of the art of the time to, to, paint, in, to paint in this way. Um, just as you see today in modern art, you see a lot of abstract art. This was kind of the style that they became used to. Well, let's move then immediately to the next period to see by contrast. And take a look at the archaic period. We see what a refinement that has occurred. Um, this is called the black figure technique, basically because the figures would kind of come out from the black clay beneath it. But also notice that the figures are a bit more lifelike. There's less interest in this kind of geometric style, this geometric outlines that were given or in telling larger stories. Here we just have a simple story of Ajax and Achilles playing a game. And you see it's more lifelike structured as indeed as time moves along, we're going to see that the Greeks start to move more toward this kind of humanistic ideal where the human being becomes the center of attention and there's this focus on project on painting on painting and on sculpting more lifelike and truer but very ideal looking structures, kind of like the structures and in individuals you'd see in magazines who are perfectly quote unquote, good looking, uh, according to some certain ideal of the culture. Well, we have that kind of ideal within the, in the classical works uh, at the time. And just another example to show some of these transitions. Uh, these are all example, examples of what's called a kuros or a boy. And here we see from some of the, the, the just out of the geometric period, the early classical period, the example of the kudos, and notice how stiff the step is here. There is a transition of the step, but the arms are kind of straight next to each other. Um, we see it's a very awkward position to stand in. Um, we see that the features are kind of abstracted in a way. Um, what you see here is a kind of the ideal of the, the boy, which is given a kind of almost godlike figure, which is kind of less human. And But as we move along, transitioning into the later, uh, classical and high classical, we see that we get this kind of, uh, notice here, This it's even more pronounced, but we see it here, that this leaning, okay, on one side, and this is called the contraposto, a relaxed leg. So what's happening is the Greeks start to think more in terms of realistic features and how to actually depict them um, also within the confines of well the ideal structure we see in this case it's much more lifelike than this one this one is f certainly more lifelike but again very ideal structures uh, which are given okay here we see another example from the high and late classical period this is the uh, for, on the Parthenon in Athens which is a uh, Parthenon is set up on a hill uh, in Athens, right in the center of Athens, and you can see the Acropolis on top, which is one of the, the temples to the gods, uh, temple. And here we see this temple. What's amazing about this temple here, you can't quite see it in the picture, is that none of these actual columns are really symmetrical, that they've been built in such way to emphasize uh, an illusion where each of the parts are sort of expanding outward, almost like a ball, so that the various columns are, have different widths and different heights even at some points, um, and so that we get this kind of projected image. Uh, the same was done, if anyone is familiar with this, uh, with Michelangelo's David, which was produced with kind of disproportionate features, 
because it would have been set at a high place, and so Michelangelo wanted the picture to look more lifelike from when you were looking from below. Well, the same is happening here with this high classical work. And we see, well, the Greeks are really starting to use the art of illusion and master their arts as they move along. Uh, here's just an example. Um, this is the mock-up of the East Pediment of the Parthenon of just the mastery of the art which the, the Greeks began to make use of. We see this harmony, balance, and grace, and very lifelike, very relaxed structures showing just complete ease with their art and their technique. So now you should understand that you know, a lot of this is certainly way past the age of Homer, but Homer's works are, are certainly brilliant works themselves, and this mastery of the artistic technique kind of blossoms from Homer and lots of the ideas of Homer in terms of the mythologies portrayed in art and in sculpture as well. So we turn now to Homer and the heroic age. Um, in terms of mythology, there's actually three different ages that we could talk about. There's the age of the original gods, okay, those gods that served in the original formation of the world. There's the age of the interaction between the gods and the hum and human beings. Um, and there's the heroic age, which is really the age that's, that centers on various heroes, uh, such as, for example, Hercules, Heracles in the Greek, and the various uh, heroes of the Trojan War. And this is the age that Homer is going to tell us about. Homer actually uh, arrives later on, uh, some hundred year, a few hundred years later, the heroic age is set around 1200 BC during the Trojan War. So the heroic age then basically tells the age of the Mycenaeans. And the Mycenaeans were a people that eventually settled in Greece and eventually developed a civilization there, um, eventually would attack Troy. Um, interestingly, much of it was actually unearthed by Heinrich Schliemann, who is a, a German, uh, kind of a businessman originally. He's a very interesting fellow. As a young, as a young, young, young man, he was, he tells this in his autobiography, he was sitting in a cafe somewhere, and he was listening to a man um, recite Homer in Greek. I believe it was Homer. And he became so fascinated that this young boy who was really came from an impoverished family, um, he decided that he would teach himself ancient Greek. And he started by teaching himself first English, and then he learned French, he learned Russian. Uh, he eventually learned something around 15 different languages. He became a very wealthy man. And later on in life, he decided to uh, use his wealth. He traveled to Greece, and he really did discover some very important um, archaeological findings within Greece, part of which is some of the findings of Troy, apparently. Um, anyhow, what we see are some of the Cyclopean walls okay, within some of the areas that he would uh, actually uncover. Uh, here's another example of the Mycenaean um, architecture, and I'm just giving these examples to show that even though these peoples lived somewhere around 12 to 1400 BC, they had some very elaborate um, architectural knowledge. And you see here's the corbel vault, and notice how each stone would be layered on top of the other, and it was calculated here to meet at this kind of peak, this capstone. So really an amazing work of architecture for that time. Uh, this is called the Treasury of Atreus, and Atreus, uh, as we'll uh, talk about later, would be the father of Agamemnon, and Agamemnon will be king Ab or commander Agamemnon, who will be uh, the great important commander of the Greeks in the invasion of Troy and Homer. Uh, here we have another example of the Lion Gate, um, and we see another kind of crowning of the Corbel Arch here, and another example of just the great feat of moving these stones must have been uh, incredibly difficult. And here finally we see just some pieces, of, for example, a dagger blade, some jewelry, and we see this is apparently the mask of Agamemnon. Again, Agamemnon, the commander of the, of the Greeks at the time. Uh, just to show you some examples of some of the work, you see it's, it's a bit different from some of the later, the, it's certainly different from the 
uh, late and high Greek classical works, which we see this much more emphasis upon primitive types of styles of art here, as opposed to the later styles. Okay, so let's start talking about Homer um, and uh, his, his age and how he kind of develops. Now, Homer lives around the 7th or the 8th century BCE. He was an Ionian. He composes the works. Again, you have to put this in quotation. Why? Because Homer arises out of what's called an oral tradition. The way you want to think of it is this, is that, first of all, most people during the time could not read or write. And so even the poets at the time, really not all of them could read or write. And so what you'd have are these tra sort of traveling minstrels, these individuals who would go around and they would sing, and usually the works of Homer were set to some sort of um, uh, lyric. And they would also tell tales. And you can imagine how some of these tales were handed down. Now, again, the Greeks were seafaring people. So you can imagine that a lot of them would go on to these var on to various voyages and they would encounter various things and they'd come back and they'd all sit around the campfire at night. Well, because they didn't have electricity, so they couldn't go inside and turn on their computer and TV. So they would sit outside at night. They'd, they'd light a fire. They'd have some wine. They'd eat some food and some cheese. And they'd... T they'd tell stories and they'd say, for example, to the to someone who had a story, hey, could you tell that story again of when you encountered that beast on the ocean? And that story would eventually be handed down and it would serve as part of this oral tradition. Now, so what Homer is credited for is having finally put down, put this sort of synthesized all of these tales into two great works and written them down. So he, Homer is really this great poetic synthesizer of the age, and really his works are probably some of the greatest poetic works that do exist um, within the Western culture. And we see similar uh, works within Eastern culture. Um, I'm not sure of African culture, but there are works like this within the Eastern, I know in the Chinese culture they have similar works. So uh, the work recounts, as I said, the Mycenaean age, which is about the 12th century, really, BCE. Um, and it is a work. Uh, it is a. It is an, the works will be uh, what's called an epic, um, and the types of lyric poetry that existed um, really during Homer's time was mostly epic, and what would evolve later would be two other types, which is that of comedy and of tragedy, and where comedy is is kind of a. It's not only this this kind of uh, what we think of as comedy today, but it's a story that has a kind of let's say a happy ending of sorts. Okay. Um, then we have, on the other hand, something of a tragedy, and a tragedy is something, well, where we have the story and the events lead up to these ter this terrible ending. You can think of kind of Romeo and Juliet as a tragedy, or if you've ever seen uh, the recent, the, not recent, the film, uh, the Titanic with Leonardo DiCaprio, that's a tragedy of sorts, okay? Um, now, the epic is a bit different. It's kind of a, um, you could say, a comedy of sorts, but it's not really. It has a entirely different purpose. It's narrative. It tells of the struggles and the trials of life, of war, of the meaning of life and death, and the purpose of human existence cast into struggles. And so this is what we see in the Iliad, which is basically discusses the war between the, the Mycenaeans, the Greeks, and the Trojans. And in the, the Odyssey, we see the travails of Odysseus, the great hero of Troy, as he attempts to sail home to see his family and is constantly set back and from this purpose. Now, the work itself is actually composed in hexameter, which is verses of six metrical feet. Um, in other words, if you think of um, a word, well, the words have syllables. For example, hex, a, me, ter. We have four syllables, verses, two syllables of it's one, six is one, metrical, three feet. Now here's an example from the work itself. An, oh, okay. Andra, mi, ennepe. Andra, mi, ennepe. One, two, three, four, five, six. You see that? Andra, mi, ennepe. And here I'm going to give you an example. Let's see if it opens. 
Meinin a edetä. He leijad jo akileos ulla menein. He myriakai ois alge eteken. Ollas defimus psiukas a idi pro iapsen he roon. Autus de heloria teuke kynesin. Oi jo noisi te daita. Dios de teleo to bule. So this is an example. Uh, we have an individual who's reading Homer in, in, in the ancient Greek in which Homer was originally written, um, Homeric Greek. Um, and you, you see it gives something of the sound of how it would be pronounced. And it would usually not only be uh, something which would be orally spoken, but it would, it would be, there would also be music which would be sung over it. Um, of course, unfortunately, the music has been lost since at the time uh, musical notation had yet to be written, which is unfortunate. So we have the two works then of Homer, which are uh, have been handed down to us today uh, in the form of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And as I said, the Iliad recounts the Trojan War, uh, approximately 12th century BCE, which was in fact a 10-year war. Uh, the Greeks did not expect it to take that long uh, they should have because Troy was very heavily defended and also known as uh, almost an impenetrable state. In fact, it was impenetrable to the Greeks, though uh, eventually they were able to concoct a ruse, which I'll tell you about, uh, through which they were able to enter. So some of the Trojans um, who, are, who will be important um, are that of Paris uh, and Hector, the two brothers, Priam, the father, who is the king Priam, and Helen, the, the Mycenaean, the Greek, who uh, with Paris are kind of the, is kind of the cause of the war itself. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit. On the Mycenaean or Greek side, we have Menelaus and Agamemnon, who are two brothers, Agamemnon being king or commander Agamemnon of the Greeks. We have the great hero and warrior Achilles. He's, he's really the warrior of legend. And we have Odysseus, who will be featured in the second work, which is then uh, below, the Odyssey. And so the Odyssey tells of the travails of Odysseus following those ten years after Troy is captured and after Troy is raised to the ground. Raised to the ground uh, means, in this sense, that it's burnt to the ground and all the men, women, and our children are put to the sword and killed. That's pretty nasty times, barbarous times, and this is unfortunately what happened. And so uh, he's one of the heroes at Troy, and he is also delayed some 10 years in his voyage back to his homeland, Ithaca, the island of Ithaca. Um, so you see that, that uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad all together we see that Odysseus is going to be away from his home and family for some 20 years, which is actually quite some time. So the Trojan War, uh, some background to it is important here, because a lot of what uh, unfolds in the Odyssey, will, it will be understood that you, you're sort of familiar with the Trojan War itself and the great exploits of Odysseus and, and the others. So here's some background here. Uh, it originates uh, really trivially in terms of a strife. We have Eris, which is this goddess of strife. So the, the Greeks, they would often uh, anthropomorphize the various um, humanistic experiences and emotions and uh, encounters we have in nature. Eris, Eris being one, one example, uh, offers a golden apple to three of the great goddesses, the Olympian goddesses, Hera, who is the wife of, we see Zeus here, who is the, 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 sort of the king of the gods, Athena, who is the daughter of Zeus, and Aphrodite, another daughter. And Eris offers a golden apple and basically says, look, the apple goes to whoever is the fairest, whoever is the prettiest, whoever is the most elegant and glamorous, okay? And now all of these goddesses are extremely sort of self-conscious and also very arrogant. You wouldn't imagine this for, for goddesses, but they are because the, the Greeks give them very human attributes, as I've said. Now, Zeus, um, uh, who doesn't want to make the decision on his own because, well, he knows that if whoever he picks um, will be happy, but the other two will be very unhappy, sends the three goddesses to Paris, who is the son of Priam of Troy, king of Troy, 
and they say to Paris, you need to judge uh, who is the fairest, and Paris, of course, judges that Aphrodite, who is the goddess of love and beauty, is the fairest, and she is so delighted that she grants that fair Helen, who is, uh-oh, the wife of the Spartan king Menelaus at the time, the Spartan king. So Sparta was renowned for basically its military prowess, but young Paris doesn't care, and he says, I want to I want Helen, and Helen is made to fall in love with him, and he visits Menelaus and steals Helen away from her. Now, the other goddesses, of course, are angered by this, and eventually they'll take sides against Paris and Troy during the war, uh, the Trojan War. But as you can imagine, he steals Helen, and Menelaus, angered, also dishonored, okay, goes to his brother Agamemnon, and says, we need to get my wife back. And of course he had right, a right to say this. Agamemnon, however, had been eyeing Troy for a very long time and was just looking for an excuse uh, to, to gather all the Greek city-states together and to make off to Troy to conquer and to take the spoils and gold of Troy. So this was the perfect excuse, and Agamemnon kind of the commander, the head of the Greeks. He wasn't really that, there wasn't a, an empire, so he wasn't the head in that sense. There were various states, and he was kind of the leader of them in this war. He gathers all the Greeks together, and they agree to go and fetch Helen. And actually, the main reason is that they want to go and pillage and steal and kill and rape. This is the, the main reasons, of course, that occur during these times. They want some gain. So they go to Troy and wage war for 10 years and finally destroy the unassailable, unconquerable city. So how do they do it? Uh, before I get into that, let's just look at some of the examples. Here we have Mycenae. Uh, notice we have Athens there, the Cyclades, there's Crete again, again, and we have Mycenae around here. And so the Greeks would have had to sail from Mycenae all the way up to Troy and finally they conquer Troy and they sail back. Um, now notice here's Ithaca. This is where Odysseus is from, so he would have had to sail back to Ithaca, and he gets lost along the way, not for his own reasons, but because the gods are angered at him, as we'll talk about later. So how do they get into the city? Well, what happens is that after 10 years of fighting, the Greek men, the Mycenaean men, become disheartened, as you can imagine. They say, look, they say this to their commanders, we want to go home, we want to see our wives and our family. And, well, it gets to a point where they become slightly rebellious, so the Greeks have to start to think, the commanders have to start to think of a new way to get into Troy, and Odysseus, who is the king of Ithaca, so we have these minor kings, and we have Agamemnon, who's the main kind of commander of all these minor kings who are attacking Troy, he comes up with this very clever ruse, and he says, why don't we do this? Let's make an extremely large horse. This is not, this doesn't represent the size of the horse very well. It would have been as large as this tower here. And we'll make a wooden horse, we'll make it hollow from within, and we will have about five or six men sneak into the horse, a couple of men. I, Odysseus, will disguise myself as a beggar and sneak into the city at night. So that's pretty brave. You have to think that here we have Odysseus, the Mycenaean, the Greek, at war with the Trojans, and he's going to sneak in there at night. So they make the horse, and they hide some men in the horse, and then, this is all following Odysseus' plans, the Greeks, they had numerous, innumerable ships, they sail away. And the Trojans, of course, are watching this from their walls the whole time. And the Trojans, their first thought, that's it, they've surrendered, and they've left us with this kind of token horse. And so the Trojans and King Priam, they ride out to the horse, and they think about what they're going to do with it. Some say we should push it off the cliffs. Another say, says that, well, we should burn it. Of course, the men inside are starting to get worried. But in the end, they decide, let's drag it into the city, 
as our victory. And let's have fun and enjoy the spoils of victory, uh, or at least not having been defeated. And so the Trojans that night throw a great party throughout all Troy, and they, they become very, they drink a lot, and eventually fall asleep. While they're asleep, Odysseus opens the door of the horse, the men climb out, and they open the walls, uh, the, door, the gates of Troy after killing the gatekeepers. And of course, the Greeks who had, who had sailed away, all the ships, they just sailed to a spot where they wouldn't be seen. They sailed back at night, and the Greeks entered Troy, and as the Trojans were lying on the steps okay, of, the, of the marketplace and outside of the porches, they're murdered by the Greeks at night, and the women are enslaved, and the children, and the Greeks finally have their victory. And so this is the tale as it takes place, um, and perhaps, you know, certainly if this was not the tale as it did happen in Troy, it has happened in other places with various ruses, and this is unfortunate travails of war. Now, uh, we're going to have opportunity to talk about this a bit more as we move along, but just to, to sort of give us some context, because the gods will be featured in, in Homer, uh, here we have the 12 Olympian gods, some of whom are more important than others for our discussion. We have Zeus, who is important, the king of the gods, god of the sky. We have Hera, who is the queen, his queen, goddess of marriage. We have Poseidon, Neptune, who is important, because he'll be quite angry at Odysseus for a very specific reason, as we'll see. And he will keep Odysseus, so he's the god of the sea. Odysseus is traveling on the sea, and he'll keep Odysseus from getting home for some 10 years. We have Demeter, okay, who won't be featured very much. We have Athena, who will be the protector of Odysseus during his travails. That's why she's highlighted here. She'll be very important in the work. She'll present herself in various images and various disguises. <clears throat> and she's also the goddess of wisdom. And we'll see that Odysseus is going to be considered a kind of a wise or cunning man. Cunning is a be the better term. You see, he came up with the ruse. We have Apollo, uh, the son of Zeus and Leto, the god of light. Uh, just, uh, I didn't mention here, but equals here, we have the Greek name, and then we have the later Roman Lat Latinized name, Jupiter is Zeus, Athena is Minerva. And so Artemis and Diana, we have Ares, the god, of, the god of war, Aphrodite, who becomes Venus, okay, the goddess of Eros, love and beauty, Hephaestus, Vulcan, okay, some of his works, will, he was apparently... Um, very renowned for his engineering and his crafts that he would make, and some of them are going to be featured in the Odyssey, such as the bow that uh, Odysseus will later string. We have Hermes, who is the messenger god. Um, uh, Michael, the Saint Michael, the archangel, <coughs> will kind of be a, a, a sort of a Christianized version of Hermes, interestingly. He's the messenger of the gods, and we have Dionysius, who is kind of the the god of festivities and wine, but also of orgies and of chaos and destruction, too. Um, now, the Olympians, as I said, they originate from the Titans, uh, who they overthrow and, and toss and tie up in Tartarus, the abyss in the underworld. Anyhow, let's move along here. Some of these gods will be featured in the Odyssey, uh, some will not, um, and so we'll have an opportunity to meet some of them uh, in more detail later on. So here we have something of the world view, we could call it, of the Greeks. Uh, what we have here is kind of a depiction of the earth. And this is important because, well, we're going to see that the gods, everything has a place. We see on the earth is inhabited by the human beings. We then have the vault of heaven, this kind of place in between. And we have Olympus, which is the home of the gods, they're inhabited here in the vault of heaven. We have these minor deities. On earth, we have even lesser ones in the human beings. And then we can go below, and we have these various rivers in the middle of the earth, and Hades, where which is who is actually the god of the underworld, uh, which I didn't list here. Strange. Uh, Hades, who is also Pluto in the Roman interpretation. Um, and he, he lords over the abode of the dead. And below that, we have Tartaros which is the part of the, that underworld, but a deeper, darker abyss in which the Titans are held. And in fact, when we get to Dante, we're going to see that actually, even though that the, the Greek underworld starts here, Dante's underworld will kind of start this intersection 
between the Greek underworld and uh, Tartarus, which is this deeper abyss. And in fact, the descent that Dante will make into hell will be this descent into Tartarus. And here we have then sort of a, a very brief overview. Okay, certainly I can't give you a complete one. Uh, a general idea of the Greek, the ancient world, uh, which gives you a nice context, which we can then use to study Homer's Odyssey.